Good evening and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Rebecca Ratliff, your host for this evening. Uh, I am a mediator and arbit international mediator and arbitrator and law professor at Howard University School of Law. I have with me our usual host, Chuck Crumpton. <laughs> the pleasure, <laughs> I have the pleasure of hosting Chuck tonight. Chuck Crumpton is a mediator and arbitrator uh, in Hawaii, based in Hawaii. Uh, we also have Professor David Larson, who is um, an ADR professional and a professor at Mitchell Hamlin Law uh, School of Law and the wonderful Louise Ng, partner at Denton's. Thank you all for joining me tonight. Good to see everybody. So tonight, um, we want, we're want we going to have a solutions-based session um, about being one, unity. We are, we are one is the title for tonight. And what we'd like to do is, uh, first, I'd like to have each of you give Give me your definition or, you know, your thoughts around what unity looks like uh, for us as a country um, and as a world, however you'd like to, um, uh, to, to, to frame your, your thoughts around that. Of course, we are the Good Trouble crew, uh, <laughs> so we're part of the Good Trouble crew. Some of us are missing tonight, but um, Chuck, what, what, is, what does unity look like in your opinion? We have a word for it. And that's ohana. It, it it means family, extended family, because we're mostly Asian Pacific, and the family here is everybody who's connected, some by blood, some by choice, as it should be. And the reason that's important to remember and put first now is we've just gone through the Maui fires, the worst disaster in our history by far. Uh, at least a hundred dead, thousands who've lost their homes, their family businesses, an entire community, which had previously been the capital of the Hawaiian kingdom, destroyed, literally leveled. And the message from our governor and from our friend Andy Weiner, who's putting together the Victims' Compensation Program here, is we are one ohana. We came into this one ohana. We must get through it, one ohana, and we must come out of it, one ohana collaboratively and in unity. If ever there was a time, it shouldn't take disaster to remind us, but if that's what it takes, please take the lesson and learn from it. We are one Ohana. Sly and the Family Stone had it right. We are family. I love that. I didn't actually know when I chose the title, I had no idea. So thank you for that. That's perfect. Um, that, that, that's perfect for, for tonight in our conversation. Louise? What does unity look like? Well, you know, I was actually thinking along the same lines as Chuck. Um, thanks to a unity march just having happened in Lahaina or to Lahaina with a, there, a wide variety of different groups showing their desire to work together to rebuild Lahaina in the right way, in the Pono way. Um, and there were some lovely quotes um, from participants in the march that I read in the Sunday paper that I that resonated with me. Um, and, you know, we have a long way to go and there's going to be differences and there are, there have been differences in opinions, but I liked the sentiment that was expressed of, you know, as we rebuild and think how we're going to use this land again and make it good for the community, we need to honor the land and its history, but also honor all of the different, the diverse communities that have settled there and made it their home and how are we going to make it right for all of them and you know this is a march that there were already some divisions for like certain, certain groups did not participate because the governor and uh, government officials had been asked to participate in the march and they did so it's not like everybody had the same idea of what a unity march should be but there seemed to be an overarching feeling that we do need to bring the community and many different groups together and if we kind of think of what the long game is, is, which is to make right by the land and all the communities that were there, um, I hope we can go forward in an overall progressive, you know, way that's good for all for everybody. And and then something that I heard recently, well, actually on today's NPR, just about the whole, you know, the ongoing debate about immigration <clears throat> and how it's been seems to be villainized by certain members of the party. But, you know, the thing that we have to remember too is that um, immigration has been good for this country. We've had so many different groups 
come in and revitalize and contribute. And it just takes a generation or two for people to start being engaged in government from so many different cultures that I think we need to remember to emphasize that point. That's a really good point. Um, immigrants built the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, slave labor and immigrants built the country. Yeah. Uh, David, what does unity look like in your eyes? Well, one thing I, I'm hoping before we end this program, somebody cues up the music and we get a <laughs> good slide going. So maybe, maybe as we go off, we'll be playing, we'll be played out the slide in Family Stone. Um, <laughs> Michael can do it's, it. it's such such a such a challenging proposition right now. Um, I, I feel like we've talked now for quite a while about polarization, and if anything, I just think it's as bad as ever. Um, yes. When I think about unity, I'm thinking in terms of maybe baby steps. That I'm hoping that we we do a better job as a community, as a country, of listening. That we really need to start listening to each other to be better able to understand where we're coming from because we're so far apart. I'm an optimist to believe that if we listen to each other, we're going to find some common ground. I mean, if we're all dealing with a natural disaster, we all have the same kind of immediate concerns. Um, regardless of our political belief, we've got to address the, the tragedy and the destruction. Um, and that's true in a lot of different circumstances. So I hope we, number one, in terms of unity, I hope we make a better effort of listening to each other. Um, number two, and I hope, kind of combined with that, that we do a better job of, of reaching out to not just listen to the same sources that we do regularly, but actually to make an effort to um, to reach out and hear some other voices, that I think that's going to be important. So um, not a real dramatic call, um, but I think it's that I think that's possible. I think it's really important that we do that, that we uh, that we listen to each other and have respect each other's opinion, um, understanding that are probably a, there are some some guidelines and parameters to that. Um, but we aren't listening, and uh, I think until we do, we're going to we're not going to get past this significant divide. Obviously, um, I appreciate that. The three three of us um, on this um, show are dispute resolution professionals, so we understand the importance of listening, active listening, probing. Reality testing, testing the durability of, of you know, a person's position um, or, or their arguments. Um, and when you brought up, David, tragedy and destruction, I thought, yeah, natural disasters and unnatural disasters that have happened, the uh, human atrocities and other um, things that we are dealing with as a world, really, um, and as a country. So there's, you know, um, fatigue, there's a fatigue that's going on with all the different um, initiatives and actions and conversations and motives. Um, and so, so one of the notes that I made uh, coming into the show was, you know, solutions, you know, what are some solutions to what divides us? And I, obviously you've um, all given some thoughts around around some solutions, um, but diversity, equity, and inclusion um, efforts are underway and listening and, and conversing is the way we continue to advance. Um, representation, the, the, the inclusion, equitable inclusion, representation, and as dispute resolution professionals, of course, we're interested in, um, in uh, equitable, favorable outcomes um, for all people. So, you know, since dispute resolution touches every single industry, every single person, how is dispute resolution um, going to be uh, at the forefront, dispute resolution professionals? How will we be at the forefront of ensuring that um, that these conversations are had, and that um, that the fatigue that we're feeling as a society um, is addressed in a way that you know we keep the conversation going. What 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 are some you know solutions uh, for keeping you know inspiring people to to jump in to good trouble? And Chuck, I can see I see you smiling. I know you have some thoughts. Well, one of the thoughts, because I love what each of you, and Rebecca, you and your questions, and David and Louise as well, that I'm Zen Buddhist, and so yin yang and the, the deep involvement and inherent roots of each in the other is 
an essential understanding that oh, within unity, there must be diversity in order for unity to have meaning and value. Oh, within the common ground, there must be difference in perspectives and orientations in order for that common ground to have meaning and value and sustainability. And if you look at the word community, the emphasized part of that word is unity. And com is just from the Latin together, unified together. So the together, again, has no meaning and value unless it is a diverse togetherness. We do that. have to be not just family. We have to be diverse family. Well, and family is, yeah, the beauty here is that, that we're all we're all family, um, you know, through our work uh, on various platforms, we've become really good friends. And, and when we exchange our emails, you know, sometimes we start off by addressing each other as family. Um, and we're, there is more about us that is similar um, than is different. And if, if we could embrace that as people, really, race is a social construct. There really is only the human race. There, there are cultures, but, you know, we really all um, are made up of the same, um, you know, things and desires and needs um, as people. And, um, you know, more conversations about that, more open conversations about that, um, even when it's uncomfortable, are, you know, I believe what will, you know, what is what will, will help us to continue to advance. And Louise and David, what are your thoughts? Louise, go ahead. Well, no, I, I didn't have an, um, I was actually wanting to listen to to you folks as the um, alter ADR professionals on tools. Um, I guess maybe my, beyond what you've said, I think that, um, you know, the beauty of a smaller community where people have grown up together is that you do have that history that exists before you formulate your political views. And that doesn't mean everybody's going to grow up and have the same views, but you kind of understand perhaps where people are coming from. Um, or you're going to be, it, it, it encourages people to have a more civil conversation. So I- Commonality. I you, yeah, kind of commonality. Kind of I, yeah, I, I love that because commonality also starts with that calm, uh, you know, root. Um, and again, together. David, your thoughts? Well, yeah, yeah, as- ADR professionals, we deal with conflict all the time, and we'd like to think that we have some skills in, in bridging communication gaps and diffusing situations. So, you know, I, I look around and I they see different places in our society where I'm seeing conflict. And one place, I'm an educator, one place that always comes to mind for me are school board meetings that uh, in the recent past have gotten pretty contentious and even explosive and a little scary. And uh, in terms of solutions, I think one thing that we could do as dispute resolution professionals is offer our services in context where we aren't usually working. I mean, we're usually waiting to get hired or retained for a particular kind of specific dispute, often involving maybe just one or two parties. And maybe we need to think a little more expansively about what we may be able to do um, with the skills that we've earned over time. And I think that that's one place in particular where we could have some value because I'm watching school board meetings just to, just explode. And um, I think it's a little scary to get involved with that, but just to offer our services, they may not be accepted, but they may be because people running those meetings are, are I think are getting pretty intimidated and unsettled. So in terms of solutions, I think as the dispute resolution professionals, if we look around at conflicts in our community that may not be the ones with which we've traditionally been involved that we might be able to offer our services. I really like that idea. Um, and while, while you were talking about that, I thought about how politics comes into these spaces like school, school boards or even church um, boards or, or associations um, and, 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 and government, of course, you know, you're going to have um, uh, politics and bureaucracy, but um, it just seems like once politics enters, I'll, I'll go back to your your school board example. Once politics enters um, the picture, then you have all of these different agendas that usually have nothing to do with what people are really there to address. If we're talking about school boards, then you know we're talking about best practices and environments 
learning environments um, for students and things just get uh, go off down rabbit holes now is what we're seeing. Um, as you said, on social media, we can just we can see on the news just so just the focus has changed. The main thing is no longer the main thing. Chuck. Uh, and I think it's really important to take that and maybe turn it on its head a little bit. Say, what if instead of looking at unity as a limiting divisive factor, who am I? What if we change just the pronoun to plural? Who are we? Mm. What if we looked at what are our differences that may contribute to our unifying? How might our differences complement each other in ways that can help us see things better, understand things better, and deal with things better, see and make better choices? It's clear statistically, data has shown without question that diverse groups make better decisions. They just do. They're more sustainable and they're more reliable and they serve more interests and benefit more people, a wider sector. We can only do that together. And instead, we've been, we're really offered two choices. And I'm not talking about the political here. I'm talking about just every day in our life. One of those choices is we can be collaborative to appreciate, respect, understand, and honor our differences as things that make us greater. The classic old saying, we is greater than me plus thee, right? We can see that, we can be that. You know, that That's got me thinking, challenge. that got me thinking about one thing we don't teach in schools, I never learned, and you learn only if you're, say, in debate or you go to law school, you go to ADR, it's just how to communicate effectively. And it makes me think about, you know, I'm on the board of a human service aid um, nonprofit here. We went to one of their in-service trainings about how they do anger management. There's a whole workbook. And it seems, you know, one of the basic premises that I took away is that you don't, you know, not effective to say the first thing on your mind, which is, I can imagine what happens in a school board. The first thing that is on your angry mind gets put out there. Um, but they they train people to have a more productive communication. It seems to me that's, you know, like English, math, and reading, that should be something that we teach in schools and teach continually, because we're all having to learn that as we go along in life, okay, that style didn't work. Let me try something else. And some people never learn. You make a, that's, yeah, excellent points. Um, when Chuck was talking, I thought about the zero sum mentality. In order for you to win, I have to lose or the other way around and how divisive that is. But then you make a great point um, about just teaching relationship repair or the, the art of, I actually do teach the art of negotiating. Um, and with that, I include a component around personality styles because your personality style influences how you communicate, how you negotiate based on motivations and needs that you have, um, natural, naturally, innate needs that you have. Um, and that's, you know, not something that is that is widely taught. Um, you know, children have conflicts all the way from the, you know, cradle to the corp to the C-suite. Uh, there are conflicts and relationships need repair and conversations need to be had. We don't talk a lot about emotional um, intelligence in mm -hmm. these situations. Um, you know, that's something that as dispute resolution professionals, um, we could probably focus on more. Um, and I do love David's idea about being in unconventional spaces, offering our services in unconventional spaces where conversations are had and um, things are hashed out. Because what we know is when a conflict is, is before us, uh, usually the root cause we have to drill down to. That's not, you know, it's the, by the time we see it, it has escalated to a, you know, a, a conflict that is is usually um, not even, you know, there's no focus on what the real problem is. So um, all of these thoughts um, are are valuable and things that we should think about. Chuck, I, I, looks like you wanted to jump in. No, I'm just, uh, I'm following both where your train of thought is coming from and where it's going. And one of the things that you notice 
it, it, it's not just convening those conversations, the difficult conversations to make good trouble, but the tone and spirit of those have to be exactly what you're exemplifying. They have to be opening. They have to be welcoming. They have to be coming out of curiosity, not out of judgment, not out of condemnation. We're here to see, to understand, to respect, and to honor the value in people. We're here to connect the best ways we can with the best people we can and see where that can go. And literally to miss that opportunity, which whether it's the four of us or any of the others gathering on these things sessions, we don't miss those opportunities. We take them and we run with them. We honor them, we build on them. And we do that in ways that connect us much more deeply, much more broadly, much more closely with and to each other and to anyone who chooses to connect with us. It's yeah. not only a connection, it's no, an offer. I wanna, I wanna pick up on something that, that both uh, Louise and Chuck said. Um, I'm kind of thinking about solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, our daughter attended a Quaker school, and um, I'm not I'm not a Quaker, but I like their philosophy, and I like the fact that they start teaching dispute resolution skills and peer mediation in kindergarten, and they do through the entire um, K through 12. Um, she was K through eight because uh, they didn't have a high school, but for all of those years, um, there was peer mediation, there was dispute resolution practices. Their skills that she gained, she's now a young adult in the workforce that that she's using all the time. Um, so I think it's just invaluable to be able to start teaching our kids those skills when they're even in elementary school. Um, so I was glad we found a school that did this. There are programs around the country. I'd like to see more of them. And I think that could help us help bring us together in terms of solutions, in terms of unity. And uh, I'm going back to something that Chuck said. Chuck made reference to the fact that we have some statistical empirical evidence that can demonstrate that diverse populations reach good solutions and yeah. explains why that's true. So again, thinking in terms of solutions going forward, one thing that we drift away from is, I think, fact-based reasoning, um, that we, we're losing our facts, we're forgetting our facts, and as I'm thinking about 2024 and the possibility of deep fakes, and you know, we saw that oh recent video with President Biden that looked and sounded just like President Biden, but it wasn't him, um, that we really need to be very careful, number one, about making sure what we're listening to are facts, but number two, then actually listening to those facts. And um, I think that we're ignoring them in too great of an extent. So. In terms of solutions, I'd like to really try and be more fact-based as a community. Important point. Um, one of the points that we've made on a previous show was misinformation and disinformation. And I, I think I said when I heard disinformation, um, I had to look it up because I wasn't sure that I had ever heard that word before. Yes. But of course, misinformation is the wrong information. Disinformation is the wrong information on purpose. <laughs> and, um, you know, when we're talking about perspectives and you know diverse perspectives um and people's tendencies to reject um an opinion that is not like theirs versus listening for understanding and and trying to to find something in common and build on that um i agree with you david um you know we have to do more of that we've we've just become a society so i, I was having a conversation with someone recently and um they said, well, you know, that's, that's, well, that's my opinion and you have to respect my opinion. And my response was, we have a close relationship so I could say it. Um, I said, no, I have to respect your right to have an opinion. <laughs> and, and, you know, and let's talk, you know, I don't have to respect your opinion. I, I have to respect your right to have an opinion. And on that basis, we can continue having, you know, having this conversation and both try to learn something or gain something. But uh, one of the things I think we try to do too uh, sometimes in conversations is, you know, less listening and more trying to convince people to think like we do when there really is a lot of value around diverse perspectives, different perspectives from different experiences and backgrounds and cultures. And David, it looked like you were going to say something. I was just also thinking that, you know, in a single word, grace is a word that keeps coming to my mind, you know, that that if we can have more grace in terms of tolerance and acceptance, I would be very happy. 
I love that. Um, yeah, definitely. We all have to, uh, we all need grace. So it would be great to extend it to, to, uh, to others. And Louise, your thoughts as we start to the wrap up in this last couple minutes, would love to hear more well, thoughts. As, as you said at the beginning, when we we're talking about how you chose this topic, I think it's a good topic to start off in as an aspirational goal for 2024. We have so many great divisions in the world that just seem insurmountable. Um, but anything we can do to sort of start baby steps, as you said, David, work on our communication, work on how we can be effective in that way while being respectful. Um, it's a big task, harder to do, but it's certainly something to keep in mind for 2024. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Chuck? You know, and I'm, I'm listening and I'm hearing, and I'm loving one of the things I'm hearing is that there's an understanding that life exists not in polar poles, but on a spectrum. We're trying to move the needle, right? Mm -hmm. From adversarial partisan to collaborative. But we're also trying to move the needle toward truth because truth is unifying. An alliance to truth is a unifying common ground. And we need to understand that the combination of that collaborative approach to each other in life and the alliance to truth is the recognition that the more diverse the truth, the more unifying it is. Yeah. And the only way to achieve it is diversely with each other and for each other and honoring each other. I love that. And in a word, uh, Chuck, um, what's, what's your word for tonight around this topic of we are one and unity? What's your word? One, oneness. I was in Buddhist. So oneness comprises all of it. I love that. Oneness. Louise, what's your word? Oh, can I have two? You I was can. <laughs> you can have a phrase if you okay, like. Okay, one word would be diversity. Two words would be embrace diversity. Love that. Definitely. Yes. And David? I hate to have to explain my word, but awareness. <laughs> and one thing I think is important is that Right now, the stock market's doing great. You know, some of us are feeling really happy, but we need to remember that not everybody has a retirement program, not everybody's in equity, that some people are living paycheck to paycheck and, um, and inflation still hasn't been completely put under control. So um, when we think about unification and a community to keep an awareness that we're not all in the same position and, and things are not distributed equitably, and and uh, we need to be aware of that. And that is the reality of the human condition. Thank you for that. My word is together. And together, we had another great show tonight. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. One honor.